Listening to your goals and dreams is our top priority at West Tennessee Bank. Benefit from our more than 100 years of experience and visit our Henderson branch today. West Tennessee Bank, focused on you. West Tennessee Bank is a division of Decatur County Bank, equal housing lender, member FDIC. There's your oral present, so we can proceed with our meeting and call it to order. First thing on the agenda tonight, we do have a recommendation to accept the board agenda. Prior to that, do I need to make a motion to accept the addendum? Okay, we do have an addendum uh, that is a recommendation to approve an adjustment to the 2021-22 school calendar. So your motion is to add that to the end of the agenda. I make a motion to add that to the agenda. There's second. Second. Okay, the motion has been made and seconded that we add an addendum to our agenda tonight. And we'll add that to the end of the listing, which will make it bullet point number nine. And we'll discuss at that time the school calendar. So all those in favor? Uh, is there any discussion on that, first of all? All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? So moved. All right, next thing on the agenda is approval of the consent agenda. I'm going to make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? It is approved. Uh, we have delegations, but I don't believe we have any delegations present here tonight to address the board. So we will move on to uh, celebrations and recognitions. And we do have uh, some good celebrations tonight and uh, some of our CTE programs and other things. So, Troy, I'll let you introduce our, our guest tonight. Well, I assume that Ginger's going to start. Is that so? We've got two groups being represented with us tonight. These are both high school CTE programs. These are the student organizations that are supported. The first one that's going to come up is our health occupation, excuse me, future health professionals. No, I'm sorry. I'm saying it wrong. Health occupation students of America. Oh, so that's easier to say, right? But uh, again, as it has been our tradition and trend to see some really excellent work out of our guys and girls who serve in these capacities and participate in these competitions, we have uh, we have uh, some representation of those who placed in the state competition. And I'm going to, before I ruin myself, I'm going to pass this off to the to the leader of the group and have her to announce her students. Okay, these are the winners for HOSA State 2021. Um, I'm Ginger McPherson and um, Jessica Emerson and Mandy Coates are also fellow teachers with me that, that help contribute to this. So first place um, this year in clinical internship and she could not be with us tonight because she had to work is Ireland Knight. She had to take a test and, and pass that test and score a certain amount, and then she was given the skills. So she had to do an intermuscular injection um, virtually while the judges watched her perform that. So I, I did tell her that I would uh, say her name and tell everybody what she had to do. Another first place team is the Medical Reserve Corps Partnership. And we have Ava Cox and Madison Harper Hopper, along with Kennedy Holman and Jacelyn Haskins, who couldn't be here tonight because of softball and work. And they're going to tell you a little bit about theirs. Okay, so we're here to tell about what MRC is and what we have done throughout MRC. Bronson. <laughs> um, MRC stands for Medical Reserve Corps. And it's a partnership through West Tennessee with Miss Alyssa Gray out of Jackson. And basically, we provide information about emergency preparedness and safety with our community. One main project that we always participate in every year is the Chester County Health Department's flu pod. And we volunteer with that and either help with like the paperwork, and insurance, or we just help with the nurses, whatever they need. Another project that we always take part in is um, the mock active shooter drill at the hospital where we record different response times and take a lot of pictures. Um, we participate in a lot of different activities, and this year we placed first, like Ms. Cooper said, and we hope to compete and place well at the national competition in June. Okay, next we have uh, second place for biomedical de debate team. Riley Halton is here to tell you a little bit about that, but also placing with him was Riley Cat Best and Molly Connor. So Riley Cat and Molly were both very excited about this, but uh, they kind of got roped into it all last minute, and I actually did it last year, so I was kind of the one to help them kind of figure out what to do with this, and 
it's a bit, it's a new experience if you if you've never done it before. And this year was even a little bit new for me since we had to do everything over Zoom. So we uh, logged on to the Zoom call with one other school and their team, and uh, we had the judges in the room also. So they were in the background, kind of just taking their notes. You can see them every once in a while, do a little hmm, and you know. <laughs> So uh, we, we had a uh, pretty good pretty good showing in that. We got second in the state. So we were really excited about that, especially since Molly and Riley Cat had never done it before. So I was really impressed with them. Uh, they both handled themselves very well. And uh, the topic was actually whether the, the ethicality of designing babies. So giving babies certain genes to have say maybe blonde hair or any, anything from blonde hair to a resistance to a certain disease. So it was a really interesting topic. We had a lot of fun with it. And I'm very proud of Molly and Riley Cat for coming in there last second to make our team. So. And they also had to take a test and they had to score a certain amount on the test with all of the information before they could even advance with the other eight schools that were in the virtual as well. So they did real well. Next we have uh, third place in health education. And that was Melina Alexander and Addison Summers. And uh, Melina will tell you about their competition. So basically we put together our PowerPoint first and then started the portfolio and it was over the stages of grief. And we thought that was important because it's a pandemic going on. So people are grieving the loss of routine and then the loss of loved ones, friends and everything else. So we did the stages of grief in order, in order to help them cope in a healthy way and went into depth about the, all the different stages and just taught a class about it, and then we put together the rest of the portfolio and then sent that in for the regional competition, which we got first place in, and then we sent it again for the state competition, and we got third place in that. And that's pretty much all we did. So they ended up teaching the wellness classes because one of their standards was to uh, identify the stages of grief and going through the, all of those to know that it's a normal process. Uh, next, we have fifth place in CPR first aid, and that was Cassie Newman, who's here tonight, and she also was a partner with Madeline Wilson. Yes, ma'am. Me and Madeline were both actually new this year to the skill. Um, we didn't really know what to expect, but we went in there and we took a test, and we placed third in regional, and then we went to state, and we competed, and we both had scenarios, and hers was she had a patient who was unresponsive, and um, fell out on the floor and had to have CPR. And mine was a person who fell and had <clears throat> severe burns all over the legs. So I treated for first aid. And whenever um, one of the victims was uh, stable enough, we both helped each other until EMS arrived and we placed it. We also had two others that, that placed with the test, but then didn't get to move on in, in advance. And then out of these students, we had 10 that have advanced onto nationals, and uh, five of them are gonna be able to compete, and that'll be at the end of June. So I'm very proud of these students. Next group coming up is, uh, again, Coach DJ Sheets. He leads our Future Business Leaders of America, or FBLA. And uh, they also have some reporting of their place, placement in both regional, which is what the newspaper reported most recently in mid-February. But since that time, they have had state competition and can give a little bit more current results of their accomplishments. Yes, so the two you have in front of you, this is on the far side, this is Carolyn Rogers. Um, this is Miss Allie's daughter, Miss FY. And then Emma Clayton, Caroline placed uh, first in accounting two, and Emma placed fourth in business law. We also had two other uh, place finishers. Um, they were not able to be here to the sporting events. Uh, one was a HOSA as well, Riley Cat. Uh, she placed first in electronic career portfolio. And the last one was Asia Stovall, and she placed fourth place in agribusiness. So for Caroline, Emma, and Asia, they all took an objective test where they were just tested on the information. And to highlight these two, especially right here, um, they both took a test in 
what would be a senior level course. Caroline is just a junior and Emma is a sophomore and they placed in the state in that aspect. So that's really impressive. Uh, Riley Cat did an electronic career portfolio where she had to break down the job process and creating an electronic portfolio for that specific career. And she did that virtually recording herself, doing it herself um, and sending that in. And so she, you know, put a lot of effort into that and actually scored really, really high compared to everybody else in the state. So that was, that's a, a big plus for us. And this is the third year in a row we've had students qualify for nationals. And of course, this is only my second year here. And this makes a total of seven students that we've had qualify for nationals since I've been here. So. Thank you all. <laughs> encouraging things coming out of high school. Uh, we want to recognize too, uh, this came in later in the, in the month, but two of our Chester County educators uh, who, who are regional finalists for the Tennessee Department of Education Teacher of the Year. You want to speak to that? Yes, we, we were uh, pleasantly surprised with the results. Thomas can probably add some more narrative to this because Thomas has really been, uh, uh, he initialized or uh, initiated the effort and made sure that the applications that the teachers who were selected from their peers at the schools uh, completed all their paperwork to be for the submission. Uh, Thomas, do you want to add anything to this before? Well, um, our two teachers are now in the top 27 teachers in the state and uh, in every region of the school and we are in the Southwest region has three representatives one K through four, one five through eight, one nine through 12. So we have two representatives in that that will actually be competing against each other here at the semifinal level. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, they have excellent resumes. They've got some great projects going on. And I hope to have them at the next board meeting to kind of uh, explain what they have done and possibly be, even have their students represented too. But we are so proud of those teachers, and, and hopefully, you know, this is where it stops. Hopefully, we'll continue to move on to the next level. Also. But again, unique to this situation, and we've had the fortunate opportunity of having teachers through the years that have qualified and reached the rank that uh, that both Diane and Brianna have reached. Um, we had um, uh, the most recent was Haley Cloud at Westchester. She reached the same level a few years ago from. Uh, getting the top 27. Then before that, we had Miss um, uh, Christy McManus, who was number three in the state. And then the year just before that's when Miss Kathy Whitehead from West won it in the state. Uh, but this is the first time that we have as a school district represented two of the three slots that we could represent. So that's, that is a unique, but a positive thing to say for the accomplishments for both of these ladies there quality educators, and we are very blessed to have them as part of the Chester County Schools team. Did we mention their names? Uh, Brianne Matheny is the high school English language arts teacher, and Ms. Diane Johnson is currently teaching third grade at East Chester Elementary. Congratulations to those, and we look forward to seeing what, what happens next. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, moving on to our next item on the agenda tonight, it is a recommendation. Uh, for the board to approve the use of our fund balance to pay off the outstanding capital project note that we have. And there's a lot of issues, things that have come together to allow that. And uh, before we discuss, you will address any of that. Well, as your narrative reflects in your packet, we have, uh, and Stacy's here, that can add a lot more details to the narrative. We have been blessed with a state, or excuse me, the local sales tax revenue that was given guidance by the state to budget that low with the expectation of shelter in place was gonna have a dramatic effect on tax revenue. Actually, our local sales tax has been really uh, well received. Uh, fortunately for us in Chester County, people have done what we've been advertised for years to shop at home. And we have been blessed by that. The school district has been also blessed by that. And then also at the national level, we have been receiving the CARES Act fund, which is now just referred to as Easter One. And, and we have had a round of new funding called Easter Two, and now a round 
three rounds called ESER three, which have added some new revenue sources to offset some of the general purpose budgets that we were going to spend for projects such as capital projects and other things. So we have had subcommittee meetings with both the finance committee and for the capital projects committee. And Stacy has provided them uh, guidance as far as why we would like to go ahead while the funding is available now in our fund balance to take the money out and go ahead and satisfy this note for the other board members. Again, we have no penalty for early payoff and it saves some money of interest. About $275. So um, while the money is available and with the fact that other funding sources have been coming in a little bit richer than expected, that was, that's the purpose of the recommendation. Okay. And that recommendation does come from the finance committee, therefore it requires uh, no second, but is there any discussion? Do anybody have any questions for Stacy or about, about this? All right. If there are no questions, do, uh, uh, let's vote on the recommendation to approve the use of the fund balance to pay off the outstanding capital project note. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? So moved. So we'll move forward with doing that. Uh, next item is a recommendation for the Board of Education to join a national litigation against uh, a, a, a huge problem. Uh, we have the opportunity to join this litigation nationally against students vaping, and uh, Troy has a little more information about that. Well, in your packet again, uh, back last month, uh, actually after your board packets went out for last month's meeting, I received a letter from one attorney from the Lewis Thompson uh, Law Firm. His name is Chris McCarty. He's based out of Knoxville. But he said this saying that there is a national litigation for, against Jules Lab. That's the one who is one of the leading marketers and sellers of the vaping devices. And again, even though in Tennessee, as it says, vaping is illegal for anyone under the age of 21, a lot of our kids uh, are um, facing those type of temptations more frequently than they should because it's marketed to them. It's given flavoring that is not just a straight tobacco flavor, but it's sugar coated with different type of fruit flavors to make it more appealing to those younger grade or younger age kids. And it is extremely addictive. And in some cases I have read that the addiction to the nicotine there is even more significant than a chain smoker with the regular, what we learned as we grew up with smoking tobacco. So this requires no funding on our part. Any receipt of any uh, results of the litigation, if they, if we are to win, we would purpose that as the request is, is we would use those funds to offset the cost of uh, preventative measures at our schools, maybe through our counseling programs, maybe through uh, coordinated school health to really put some more resources in to defer kids or deter kids, excuse me, from using these types of products in the future. Is there a motion that we approve this recommendation uh, to join this litigation? I make a motion that we do. Second. A motion that we made in second. Are there any questions about this at all? All right, if there are no questions, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So moved. So we will join that litigation against student vaping. Uh, our next item on the agenda is a recommendation to remove the board policy 5.119, which is our current critical infrastructure designation. And uh, several reasons we're looking at doing that. And Troy, I'll have you touch on, on those. Well, it is, uh, and again, Thomas has been involved also on the staffing side. We have not had any Chester County school staff who have been an active case with COVID since before spring break. That is uh, February. February. February, right before the winter uh, ice storm. Okay, so we've gone over two months That's correct. without any adult um, cases or active cases in our school district. Uh, recently in our kids, we went prior to that uh, until last week, we went for six weeks with no students at all because the ones who were age five to 18 age group were not attending Chester County schools. But recently we've had a few, but those few have 
resulted in parent contact. So it's not something where there has been a school situation that has resulted in a transfer or a creating a, 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 a contagious setting. So um, I sought out, well, talked to Shane first, and we looked at this because there are some, again, some spring uh, social events that the high school uh, leadership, student leaders have been planning for with their senior prom. We've been working in deliberation with Freed Hardeman, I say we, uh, high school staff more than I have, working with them to set up for commencement um, and to remove some of those hurdles that our critical infrastructure designation requires, which says in that 5.119, that there can be no social or no school sponsored events outside of what's sanctioned through TLBUS AA. With the results of our current data with no staff and very few students, actually, as of today, the report, nine in the, in the entire county are active uh, and two of those are school age kids, which are probably two of ours. So um, that's about a 22%. And again, extremely low single digit numbers in our entire county. So I feel like that it is a good opportunity for us to have some normalcy return before we finish this year out. So that is my recommendation to uh, rescind the 5.119 and go back to what we had previously, which was 5.400. Both of those uh, policies have been included in your packet so you can see what type of reflection will occur if we do have active cases if you as a board decide to follow through with my recommendation. Is there any questions or comments about that about how that would affect us? Yes sir I do. Okay. Um, I suppose we we have to maintain the preventative measures that are listed within the policy to to remain a critical infrastructure, maintain that designation. If we if we try to amend any of those, we would lose that designation anyway, right? Yes, and, and I would say this, I, I meant to say it already. I did talk to Emily Rushing, who's our regional director, told her what we were thinking about given our current numbers, uh, and really just opened the floor up to her. Do you have any opposition to this? She knows our numbers as well as I do because she's the one to receive all the contact tracing that happens within the school districts, again, in her region that she supports. I also talked to our board attorney about this, just to make sure that we weren't doing anything in violation of what we could do given our current numbers. But uh, both of those were very, were, were supportive. I don't say very supportive. Our board attorney was very supportive of it. But I don't know if that answers your question, Mark. I probably didn't answer it well. I don't think it did, but I think I understand. Uh, what I'm looking at is if we just want to, could we just modify, and I'm not opposed to rescinding it, but I'm just thinking out loud here. Could we not modify the policy and keep some aspect of it? Well, we are planning to follow the Tennessee promise, which is still, do you want to talk to that? Well, Thomas? yeah, I, I can address that. Basically, when we put critical infrastructure into place, it was to allow our staff to continue to work if they had been exposed to the virus. And they would do that by testing, you know, having two negative tests during that time. Now, in essence, if we were seeing critical infrastructure, we would revert back to the Tennessee Department of Health guidelines. Whereas if you have been exposed to the virus, then you must isolate, you know, for 10 days. Uh, also, we have, uh, we have not done away with COVID leave in the unfortunate event a staff member does you know have to quarantine for any reason uh, they will still have up to 80 hours uh, that if they have not used those hours as of yet and that will go through the end of june also every principal in our district said we do not want to do away with the mask mandate we do not want to change the dress code at this particular time so that will stay in place. And of course, all the procedures about social distancing and things of that nature, because indeed those are Tennessee Department of Health and CDC guidelines. And ourselves more so with the Tennessee Department of Health is uh, kind of where, whose jurisdiction that we're under. But uh, I believe I can answer a little bit better now that I've had a chance to process your question. 
we don't have the jurisdiction to pick and choose of the critical infrastructure what we want to maintain or not maintain. So that's the reason why we felt like it would be better served. And that's why I did go to the regional director and get her feedback. She was supportive of it because we are still going to follow through the same practices that keeps our schools open. We're just now facing the, the situation that if we do have those staff, who are, see, it didn't impact any of the kids. The kids do the same thing now than what they would do if you guys do pass this critical infrastructure designation reduction. They would still have to quarantine for 10 days uh, if they're a close contact. But now for our staff, they would have to go into the application of their 80 hours of extra paid sick leave that you guys carried through at the last board meeting through June 30. So that's the, to, to reduce the critical infrastructure is allowing us to have more of these school sponsored events outside of what's sanctioned right now by the T. Lewis to the way. So I understand. They're still going to be under the same restrictions as far Correct. as social distancing, Correct. wearing masks. And a lot of this is, is geared toward getting back to normalcy as far as uh, graduation. Right. So, what are we looking at there as far as restrictions at that time? Can we? Clay, would you mind addressing that question? Come up a little bit closer because this might be something somebody would like to hear spoken. We've been in communication with uh, Fred Hardeman because uh, that's historically the facilities that we use. Uh, they graduate on that Saturday. Uh, so we've got word from Fred Hardeman. Anything we do before that, before their graduation, they would require that we wear a mask uh, during that event. Anything after Saturday, they said it's up to us. Uh, on what guidelines the school would want to perform, they're not going to enforce any guidelines on us as a as a as a university. So that would that would encompass our uh, baccalaureate on the Sunday night and then our graduation on the following Monday. So basically, uh, any limitations would be up to us to set uh, at this time. Uh, you know, with the numbers that Mr. Kilzer has has spoken about, then we, we plan on not enforcing any number of restrictions. Uh, Mask is still kind of, we're still waiting to see kind of what, what we need to do there, but we're going to wait closer to the date to do that. But I know our parents are wanting to know where it's going to be, how many people can we invite, and those kind of things. So Fred Hardeman has, has told us that after their Saturday graduation, that we that any limitations will be up to us. And all they ask is that we disinfect it following the events is kind of where we are. Don't and, leave out anything. Is that kind of and I would say also before you sit down, Clay, just to confirm, that the choice of going back to Lloyd was your student. We, we, uh, we talked to our student leadership and their number one option was Lloyd without restrictions. And then if that, if we were going to have restrictions, they wanted the field with no restrictions, but the, their number one, our student uh, senior leaders uh, requested that Lloyd with no restrictions was their number one option for graduation. That was my question. Mm -hmm. And I apologize. I don't think I worded that question very well, but I'll make a motion that we rescind this uh, policy 5.119. Okay, the motion has been made to rescind and uh, has been seconded. Is there any other questions, any other discussion before we proceed to the vote? Okay, if not, all those in favor of rescinding that policy say aye. 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 Any opposed? So the policy is at this point is rescinded. Uh, the last item of business on our agenda is our added item at the beginning of the meeting where we have added to the recommendation to adjust the 2021-2022 school year calendar uh, because of some things that have developed since our approval of that calendar. And uh, Troy has, can speak better to that. Okay, um, again, uh, this is just a conversation that really was initiated this week. Uh, as your agenda, and I know you have not had as much time to read it, reflect on that addendum that I added to this agenda, that this uh, winter into the spring, we have joined a group of a consortium of school districts in East Tennessee that had been offered to us that have, are using the same case benchmark assessments that we are. And we are sharing resources and knowledge and experience with this group it's referenced here and the official title, their title or the, comp the consortium is Comprehensive Educational Resources or what we just call the CER group. And what we are doing is, and all of us are doing this, we've joined in and uh, 
There is a funding source in East Tennessee called the Nice Walker Foundation. It's similar to the Ayers Foundation that is supporting us also this year with um, work that we're doing with the NIET, which is another separate organization. But in this CER group and the Nice Walker Foundation, they have got this uh, consortium of school districts together. And what we are doing is we are, again, purposing three assessments through the course of the school year, one in the fall, one in winter, and one in the spring, that give us a formative assessment analysis of where our students are in their current levels of performance with what's being taught. It has been a very useful tool to support teachers and principals and district leaders to have conversations around the results and how can we remedy shortcomings or celebrate successes and share strategies that have led to those successes. Jill Faulkner, Dr. Jill Faulkner has been more uh, taking point on this because she is our district representative with the CER group. And as a side note, some of our own teachers have joined in this consortium to build lessons that are based on the content standards that we're all required by law to teach in the state of Tennessee. So it's it's building a wealth and a, and a, and a repository of well-taught lessons with many districts. Dr. Faulkner attended a session earlier where she got to hear the feedback from a successful district recently with how they were handling their data chats, what we call, where the teachers reflect on the results of the students' work and begin to remedy those shortcomings or to celebrate successes. And what that other district identified as one of their sources of, of success was to have a day set aside after each one of those benchmarks where the teachers can have a P or professional development day where the students are absent, but where the teachers are present and being able to get into the data and have an opportunity to look at it individually look at it in small groups, maybe with grade levels or subject matter to the point where there is a school-wide plan that is generated through the course of that day. So we were looking at the possibility of aligning our 21-22 school year to coincide. And it would just require a little tweaking with the schedule. And the tweak is seen here on your uh, draft. What it would do would be to add an additional staff development day in the fall and as you see in your calendar draft, that additional day would be following our fall break. Prior to the fall break is when our students take the first benchmark. So the results come in almost immediately after, but we would take our fall break and coming back after the fall break, the students would be out again for an additional day and that following Monday, which would be October the 18th, that would become a staff development day for the teachers. Staff development day, using our stockpile days, still counts as part of the 180. So we're not adding any school days to the calendar. All we're doing is just transferring it from being an actual school day with kids present to a school day with kids absent. The January 2nd or January 3rd is the date that we would use which is already on the books and it was already approved by the board previously. And that would take care of our winter or our second assessment. But then for the third assessment, which comes before our spring break, what I'm asking for you to, you to, um, to uh, approve is to move the May 20th date from a staff development day which is at the very end of the school year for 21-22, or is the last full day um, present for just the staff and substitute that May 20th date with a March 28th date instead, which is again, same practice the following Monday after our spring break. Again, what we're wanting to have is an opportunity for our teachers, our principals, to be present, to look at the student's data, to be able to do that without interruption from the school day, rather than having to work out and just have smaller groups meet during planning time because of other commitments with their kids and teaching, to have a really concentrated, but, but I hope efficient way of, res, of determining what plan in place to either remedy 
issues to correct or to be able to know how we can advance or um, promote students to higher grounds of learning uh, in through the year. Again, our case assessments, the last year was measured, reflect about a 96 to 98 percent correlation with our state results. So if we can really remedy what we're seeing from our assessments and these formative assessment pieces and really move to higher ground with those kids who are close to being considered proficient and get them over the top, we can see some very dramatic changes in a positive sense in the results as we are compared in the future in state assessments. So it is just to, again, add another staff development day in October, October the 18th, and then to adjust our spring semester where the 20th becomes the last full day of school and substitute that staff development day with March the 28th, the following Monday after spring break. The state only allows us to have three stockpile days used for professional development. So that would be the full quota for this upcoming year. Any questions about that? Okay. Now your motion, we approve this recommendation to adjust the calendar. We approve the recommendation. Okay. Right, motion's been made and seconded. Any other questions or discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And so moved, it is approved. Uh, final thing on the agenda is just if there are any questions on our updates, such as our capital projects and uh, other things going on, if any guys on the board have any questions, do you have anything you want to share? Yep. Okay. Any, any questions? Okay. Of course. Clay, is vaping or e cigarettes, is that a major problem? Yes, sir. I, mean, I, we, we, uh, I dealt with the situation just yesterday where I just off the cuff, ask a kid, what percentage of our kids do you think in our high school vape right now? He said way above 50, closer to 70. Really? Now, that may have been an exaggeration, but it, it wouldn't surprise me. It, it, it's a problem. They're so easily hid. They look like a, I mean, some of them are small, smaller than pencils. I mean, they can put them in their pocket and it's so easy to hide them. Uh, and, and unfortunately, access to get them is, is very easy as well. So, bathroom, is that where it takes place? Is that that, that's probably the number one place, but uh, there is Brazen is doing it out in the open now because there's really, there's no smell to them. So unless you actually are watching a kid do it, right. they can do it while they're walking down the hall and you would They do it, it in the classroom and blowing it in their sleeve and you would never know it. Is no. that and act like they're causing it's not a tobacco smell it's, it's, it's like sometimes ice. it could be a fruit flavor it's banana smell. ice was yesterday but, but i see people in a car and it looks like the car is on fire when they <laughs> breathe that i mean is it not does it not give off well there's, there's different types of uh some of the smaller ones don't give off as much smoke as, as, as they do but yes the bathroom is our number one problem area but if you stop the bathroom they just do it somewhere else absolutely it's a problem in general is a problem we have teachers that are very adamant about when they have a, and, and they'll walk into the bathroom just to make a sweep and it's they'll open the door and there they are and they they send them to us but our teachers are doing what we asked of going in making their right but the kids just they, they just not a lot of times they get away with it so they, they does the kids understand what it's doing to their lungs uh, i don't think so I think they hear, and they'll tell you they hear, but I don't think they comprehend what that means. Is that something that we could have a, a uh, what's my word, someone, to, a motivated student type speaker to come in and, I don't know, that, that it's. Yeah, once yeah, we're allowed the opportunity to have speakers back on campus, I, that, that would definitely be great. Be and this Ms. Griffin, the Student Health Council has led some initiatives previously on anti-vaping and anti-vaping messages, and, and they've done several things previously. Not quite as many this year because of COVID, but they've already really promote that message when they come back from CCI and those things. And, and the, that's part of the reason why I wanted to join this litigation, because of winning that, you're given funds to afford things like what you're describing. And there are things like vape detectors that can be installed in restrooms and things like that. Yes, sir. Well, let me ask you this. When they're caught, what's the penalty? We treat it like 
we treat it like if they were using a cigarette. It's, okay. it's the same under our school board policy, and, and that's uh, first offense is two days in school, and then we're required to do a juvenile citation on it as well. If, if they're juveniles. And the juvenile citation is we fill it out, send it to Roger Boland, and he, of course, COVID has, but he waits till he gets several of them, and he has a, a day or an evening that they come in and they do a educational video. This is what, but the problem is it's, they're already doing it by that point, but uh, we send those in and he handles that side of it. Does the, does the parents, do they need to be educated too? I mean, does parents realize that this is going on? A lot of times the parents don't understand. It's a highly addictive situation. I mean, I would say that there is no doubt that the kids know that this is harmful, just like any drugs are harmful, but still, to me, that proves the addictive nature of this. I think it is, as what I would have read, it's more addictive than cigarette smoke. And again, it's not It's not a, like a tobacco smell or flavor. The, right. the, the flavors are strawberry ice, banana. They're very enticing with the, 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 the flavor is fruit. And, and you would think someone's chewing gum. Right. Well, the next time you're in a service station, just look at the counter. They got them, I mean, they're, they're right there an easy view for in our and undoubtedly they're being sold i guess and i can tell you i know people personally that have started and then they've tried to quit and they just can't because yeah. it really is that addictive they, they'll they'll throw them out the window one day and they'll, they'll say i'm done i'm done and then two weeks later you'll see them and they'll be, they'll be hitting another one it sounds like it's a problem maybe what scares me is there's not been enough research yet to know the exact right. harmfulness of it. Right. There's starting to be some, but not enough. To... Thank y'all for policing. Now, I know you are. I just wanted for my information. But... Anything else? Well, updates or questions? All right. If there's not, I'll just uh, share that our next uh, meeting will be coming up in May. It'll be uh, on or sorry, yeah, there it is. May, May 20th, there we go. We have a lot coming up here. May 20th, and of course, we'll have uh, baccalaureate graduation May 16th and 17th. So we'll be there as well. Uh, with that being said, is there a motion to adjourn? I'm not the one. Second. Uh, no, we are adjourned.